I live as Jesus and the apostles lived, you know, just giving everything away freely. So everything I do, uh, I was told many years ago by Jesus that uh, that this world, there's many things that you can buy and sell in this world, but salvation or enlightenment is not one of them. Uh, just to be happy, and to freely give that happiness away is really an honor, I think. And, and that's really what all of us are, are moving towards, is just le learning to let God's love flow through us so freely that we don't have any expectations about anything from anyone. You know, we're just there to like give the, like a, like a flower sends its perfume and its fragrance off into the wind. It doesn't tell the wind where to blow it or, you know, which direction or whatever. It's just very much of a giving uh, mode. And that's the, that's the mode where you realize that you're, you're it, that you have it in your heart and you give it away so freely. So, these are very intimate discussions, even though sometimes they're smaller groups than this. This is a pretty, pretty good sized group, but we can still have the same intimate feel in this group. And I certainly hope that uh, during the week as things unfold, whether you're here for just a day or a weekend or for a whole week, that this is a really important time to pour out what's on your heart. And to me, spirituality has to be very practical to be useful. So instead of just kind of having a lot of high ideas, it's like having it put into practice in your life, in your daily life, is very important. So if you have issues, if you have things that you're dealing with, this is a place to bring them up, throw them out on the table, so to speak, and let them be used for enlightenment or for clarification for everyone. Because that's really what this is about. It's not so much about bantering ideas and concepts about it's about really coming to live in that experience. Where you, your trust is so strong that you just kind of flow along every day, moment by moment. And it feels as if like every moment is just given to you clean and fresh. Like it's not a repetition of something that's gone before. But it's just like, ah, oh, this is what I have to be doing in this moment. It could be anything from, you know, working in a flower garden or uh, going on a hike or a walk or speaking or going and giving someone a hug, it, you know, it can come in many different forms, but what we're here to do is come into that experience and uh, raise those questions. There are no questions that are off limits. We don't have any kind of uh, taboo areas where you can't go into that area and everything. To me, uh, living this experience is a, it's a very much of a transparent experience. When you're in alignment with God, everything you do is very transparent because you have no secrets, you're not trying to guard anything, hide anything, protect anything. It's just, you know, you're an open book. And people feel that when you when you meet them and they feel like you're an open book. Uh, uh, Jim's always saying that Catherine, people uh, see her coming, it doesn't matter whether it's a grocery store or whatever, they look airport. at the airport, they look at her face and they, they're like, I could tell anything. I can unburden my whole heart on this woman. And they do. And they do. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of feel we want you to have in this kind of group, you know, that you can share whatever. Uh, I have, in all my travels over the years, you know, in doing these groups, and I've done like thousands of them, that's what people feel, why they feel energized and they feel a sense of lightness, is they feel like they can pour things out and take a look at things without a sense of judgment. And people tell me, like with Catherine, all kinds of things. Where they'll kind of start to tell me and they'll have like a searching look in their eyes, like, are you going to judge me if I tell you this, my deep, dark <laughs> secret from the past that I've kept locked up or whatever? And then they kind of look in your eyes and they kind of get the feel, I think I can tell this. And then when they tell it, just in that moment, in the telling it and not being judged, it's like it loosens. It's like that's what the forgiveness is. That nothing is held against anybody, no matter what it was. So that's also part of the, the feel I want to have with this whole group. And, uh, ah, here comes Paul. We have some live music. I think I see a flute, flute case in his hand. Sorry to break in. Oh, no, the group keeps That's expanding. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful.
been doing, and you just walked right in, is we just went around the circle and everybody was sharing uh, in a very casual, relaxing way their name, where they came from, and the reason that they're here. So that everybody <laughs> feels like they know everyone, and, and you've walked in right at the tail end of that, so that's perfect. And the circle just kept expanding and expanding. Um, I'm So we may have a little live music interlude in here. <laughs> it's great too with these when you have a weekend or a full week. You know, a lot of spontaneous things can happen. And uh, even though I do a lot of gatherings and sessions, sometimes there are smaller groups or one-on-ones that, that go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, I was with a family recently in New England for about 20 hours, and they came and the whole family, the, the father, the mother, the two children, and. They said, oh, our life has changed forever. Almost like the whole course of their life was changed. Because they said before, before they came to the gathering, they were like bickering in the car, like a family arguing. And then when they got there and spent about, oh, about 12 hours, 13 hours the first day, and then later on some more hours. It was like when they went back, they were kind of floating on a cloud, just in silent reverence. And that's really what I would want for everyone here. Uh, everyone wants to let go of this chattering judgment in the mind. Everyone wants to feel connected and joined, uh, so much so that you know you feel so loved and you feel it just radiating <coughs> through the center of your being that you don't have to you know listen to the ego and go out looking for scraps, <laughs> a scrap here, a scrap there. You know, it just becomes so full and rich in your in your life that it just like beams through you wherever you go and that's really what the intimacy is. And for me it's just been going on so many years that now I get invitations to other countries. Um, just got back from a couple different trips to Europe and Canary Islands, and it's it just shows you that it's not it doesn't even have anything to do with language. You know, when I'm over there, translators show up, and and there's such joy. You could be going around eating ice cream cones. You could be on the beach. You can be doing all kinds of different things. It doesn't have to be a life where you feel like you're just grinding out an existence or just trying to make ends meet or whatever. It can be a life of uh, where you just give your life over to God and then all of a sudden things start to happen. Invitations come, people uh, offer you things, they, they want to just share your happiness and joy. And this is kind of like uh, even the Southern hospitality where people open up their homes and they say, come on in here. And uh, I, there was one time when I was staying with Jim and Catherine and uh, we lived in like a little uh, retired pilots community, they had their own little runway strip, uh, and we went around, Jim and I went around into all of the homes, uh, one by one, uh, just going into their kitchens and living rooms and having these wonderful holy encounters, and it was such an intimate kind of experience, and very simple, but it really radiated from Jim's devotion to this path of just being open and friendly and welcoming to everyone, and therefore, uh, you know, can you imagine going to a community and just going door to door, uh, not with something to sell, <laughs> but just getting welcomed in from kitchen to kitchen, from living room to living room, and just having these beautiful, joyful chats? That's what that experience was. Can I ask you a question? Huh? Sure. Do you go and ever go into situations where the reception is not that way, where there's a huge amount of resistance or? The mind is very close to, I mean, we're, most of us here are probably familiar with the Course in Miracles. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of in the Bible Belt <laughs> here in Atlanta, and um, you had an experience just last week where um, I locked myself out of the house and went to a neighbor just a couple of doors down. I'm in a rental home, and so I don't 
necessarily know the neighbor, but there was a car in the driveway. And so um, she happened to be reading her Bible, which I commented on, and, and she asked me, um, you know, if I if I read the Bible, and I said, well, I have read the Bible, and there ensued a conversation where she asked me if she could ask me some questions, and I said, sure, and I was very open to that idea. But in, in the answers that I was giving, um, I, I couldn't help but notice um, the horror. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just the, the shock almost that I actually was sharing what I believed. And so I was wondering, obviously, I mean, when you come to a circle like this with people that are familiar with the Course, there is that welcoming, there is that openness to letting go and joining and a um, more clear understanding but when you're in a situation where it's very apparent that there are thousands of ways to get to the same place but, but that's not how she sees it at all it's like how do you join in that situation yeah good question I most of the people I meet around the country and the world do not study of course in uh, even though I, a lot of places I go, like this was set up kind of as a Course in Miracles gathering, uh, more and more and more over the years it has become the case that uh, the majority of my time, I mean hours and, and days and weeks is spent um, on the road with people that have never heard of Course in Miracles. In fact, when you travel a lot and you go to restaurants with waitresses, waiters, you go to rest areas, grocery stores, uh, you know, you're in hotels, you're, in, you're on the road, taking a bus somewhere in the back roads of Argentina with, my, you know, with workers, my workers, farmers. Uh, I find myself in huge arrays of situations where people, A, don't know about A Course in Miracles, and B, don't know about metaphysics. If you mention the word metaphysics in their language, they, they might say, what's that? Uh, they have no clue. Uh, for me, that's what the whole joy about it is, is the, the Course is leading to an experience, not that you have to stop judging, but that you actually get to a point where you realize <coughs> that you have no capability whatsoever of judging anything. Almost like a, like a Chauncey Gardner kind of being their kind of uh, innocence, you know. And typically nowadays when I travel, like uh, when I was in Argentina recently this year, uh, this woman, I went into the rural, I get taken a lot to the rural areas, away from the cities, and the people um, live such happy, simple lives, and we kind of look into each other's eyes, we don't even have to speak the same language, we're like beaming. I was taken back to this little meditation hut. This woman had a white flowing dress on, she just, she saw me and she just came running over, gave me a big hug, and then she took my hand and we went off running like two children skipping with their dress flowing behind. And we were running across back towards this hut in Argentina, and finally this man stopped us, who was her husband. He said, what? <laughs> who are you running off with? Who is this guy? And what are you running through the fields here? Or anything? And she says, he's come to share about love and spirit and everything, and he embraced me. And I was taken back to this meditation hut, and we sat down, and her two little children, um, came following in, and we all sat there in this meditation hut, and the kids kept looking into my eyes, and then they were giggling and laughing, and then the mother translated uh, what they were saying, um, he is like us, he is like us, it was like we were all just in a little childlike sense of glee, um, just experiencing the joy of the moment, and they, the kids recognized me, and, and had their mother translate, he is like us, that was a, an encounter I did a gathering there, most of the people, there was maybe two or three people there who had heard or studied the Course, uh, and most of them <coughs> had not. And yet we all just rejoiced and laughed, and the Spirit flowed through in a way that when they asked their questions, it was just the universal Spirit and all of us answered. But I didn't even have to use a lot of uh, Christian symbols or anything. <laughs> okay, she asked me, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? <laughs> do you believe in the devil? Uh, do you believe in hell? <laughs> you know, she was asking very specific, do I believe that the Bible is the complete and only truth? Um, I got that two days ago myself, and 
Well, let's take the questions, neighbor, yeah. When, when my neighbor, <laughs> I was telling her about the, there was an experience that Jeffrey and Carrie had us do the last time I saw them. Hold hands and look into one another's eyes and behold the Christ. And I was trying to get her to come here and tell her that's one thing we did last time. And she said, they won't make me hold hands with anybody else, will they? And I'm like, no, you don't have to do anything. I can't look in anybody else's eyes because when I do, I see, e what if I see evil? <laughs> and it doesn't exist, but I couldn't, I, with, with the, you know, she went right back to the Bible being God's only word and Jesus dying for our sins and only one way to be forgiven. And for everything I do know, I couldn't respond appropriately. I ended up folding up my tent. <laughs> and, you know, the conversation was over. But I could certainly use some help. And yeah, well, let's, we could come out. We can come at some of those questions she was asking you because that would help right with that. And I really felt comfort in my answers yeah. with it. But, but you can't help but discern and <laughs> look at somebody's face. They're, like, horrified to actually believe these things. And so it was just a reflection of, you know, my own sense of judgment, my own sense of the times in my life when I've been less than open to other people's paths or whatever it might be. I mean, it, it's always a reflection of my own mind. At the same time, I, I'm trying to understand how to share when somebody asks me a point blank question. I, I can't really control how she chooses to receive the information, yet I, I did experience less than complete peace in that situation. And at one point I finally just said, you know, it seems very obvious that we, we have very divergent ideas about getting to the same same path. And she said, well, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are going to hell. And I said, and I said well, I just don't believe, I just don't believe that. And I kind of ended the conversation when a dog outside barked, and I said, I think my husband's here to bring the keys to let me in the house. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, certainly it's much easier when you're in a situation where everybody's like wanting to expand their mind, and wanting to know, and wanting to join, and wanting to feel the love. But that's not how that particular situation was. And so what do you do in that situation? Yeah. And did you have a comment? I thought you were going to go. Yeah, I was in a, a book club meeting at the church that I attend. It was a Methodist church. And the book was for five people to meet in heaven. And a discussion ensued about heaven. And um, one person said, you know, when judgment day comes, I just want to find out that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't. <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? Of course there's going to be a judgment. I don't think so. And what I realized while doing that was, it was my judgment of her. That's the only thing that I was seeing. And uh, that was the only thing that was real to me, was my judgment of her being wrong. It didn't make me feel good. So what I realized was, the only judgment was in me. It's not because she said, well, of course there's going to be a judgment that it's stupid. So most people will take that as, you're wrong. But I took it as, no, you're wrong. And that's all I saw. And she might be right. Huh? And, that, and I don't know the answer to the question. So me judging her for her beliefs is just as ridiculous as her judging me. That's what I took away from it, is that I'm not going to feel good about that either way, unless I just allow her to keep it. Yeah, I think that's a good lead into where the answer goes for the question. Yes, I think too. And David, just this week I was reading one of David Hawkins' books, I think it was an Eye for an Eye, and he was describing, you know, the state of affairs of, you know, the world religions. And, you know, just factually, from a very high space, what's going on? And I thought, it's so perfect, you know, how screwed up, you know, the world religions are. It's just perfect. What an opportunity. And, you know, my parents sent me to Catholic schools, and I should be grateful, you know. But, you know, original sin, the crusades, and... Limbo. Limbo. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Purgatory. 
purgatory. And so, you know, I should be grateful to him, but, you know, the, but the way that it's, when, when I read David Hawkins and he puts it into such perfect description of what the opportunity is, the opportunity is perfect. I mean, the way the religions are screwed up is perfect. I mean, it's, it's, the opportunity, it's just like you walk into that opportunity. You don't see the problem. The opportunity is so enormously perfect. I just had that experience reading it this week. It's just beautiful. The world is a paradise of wonderfully screwed up in the funniest way <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yes, opportunity with a big O. Yeah. Because what I would say is that in general what you find is the more you're able to let go and just let tune into that voice and, and let it flow through you, you will inspire joy. And it, it's not like, it doesn't say you will inspire joy in those that believe like you. You will inspire joy across the board. I think for me it started early on, way before I started the course. I remember as a, as a child or as a teenager, um, uh, like we'd be at the house, I'd be at the house with the family and, and I would see these people coming down the street, Jehovah Witnesses were coming down the street, to come to the, the door. And the, my family got to know me after a while, they knew I was going to open the door and invite them in. Uh, in the living room. So the family, the brother, the sister, or my sister, mother, father would run and hide in the, in the back um, bedroom. At, as the people would walk down the street, and I would open the door, and we would have this wonderful uh, encounter in the living room. And then when it got quiet, and my parents and my sister knew that they had gone, they would come back out, you know, and resume their positions at the TV or whatever, the couch, <laughs> whatever they were doing. But for me, that was, the, that was the practice, because already I thought, whoever was coming, I thought, my gosh, if somebody cares enough to go door to door to talk about something, whether it's... A, Avon salesman or somebody even with religious, they care enough to go traping out through the weather and the heat and everything. My feeling was always, I want to join with them. And I would always give it over to the spirit and say, I haven't a clue uh, how, how to join with them, but I really want to join with them. I want us all to feel a sense of joy. And this is Jehovah's coming in, you know, and it didn't matter what they were presenting to me. I got so much practice over the years, so I seemed to get different missionaries and people that would come a lot. and. Um, and the family would always do the same thing, but I ended up, at one point I was with two Jehovah Witnesses and I was sharing and um, they were asking me about the Bible and if I thought, you know, if it was literal and I, I would start to just let it flow through me and one of the two turned and said, two Jehovah Witnesses, one of them turned and said, that's exactly what I've always felt. And the other one just turned and looked like, what are you saying? Are you agreeing? <laughs> but it got to the point that there was joy. Because I would always focus on what do we have in common, uh, what, what joy, what can we rejoice in. And when I would focus on that, I was not focusing on beliefs and differences in beliefs. Because that's where you start, you know, splitting hairs. And now I've transferred that now, I do that with everybody. I meet with people who, have, who believe many, many different things, aside from just one denomination or one or this or this or that. You know, uh, when somebody asks me something like, you know, do you believe Jesus uh, died for your sins or whatever? I mean, actually, the crucifixion and the resurrection were part of a prearranged plan that was used to demonstrate uh, divine love. And the crucifixion was part of uh, Jesus' teaching example. Uh, so, in that sense, <laughs> really, it's true. <laughs> Jesus died to show that there was no sin. You know, it was a demonstration. but. In Christian terms, and in, in for somebody who's coming from more of a traditional or a fundamentalist background, in their terms, that's a very important witness and demonstration. You know, that's a key thing. And it, it was. It was a very extreme teaching example that even the Course says was to demonstrate, you know, that you can't kill the Son of God. You know, uh, what a great teaching that you can't kill the Son of God because he was demonstrating for all of us that we're spirit and that we go on and live forever and ever. Uh, so a lot of the questions that I get asked, even like the ones you were being asked, I can answer with a lot of joy. Um, the other thing about being saved, uh, you know, that's a, a key issue. I mean, to be saved, though, from what Jesus is talking about and what's talked about in the Bible about the constant renewing of your mind, you really have to have a pure heart to really accept your salvation. 
I mean, it doesn't so much matter, even if you're working with the Course, uh, what, how you talk about that term saved and salvation, you see that it's, it's a big job uh, to purify your heart. And so, uh, and what was the other, there was one question there about, um, it's about believing in Jesus, but uh, what's one of the second questions? The devil and hell. Oh, the, the devil and hell. You know, do you believe in sin or the devil or hell? You know, what the Course even teaches is, is as long as that you still find guilt attractive, as long as anything of this world seems attractive. Uh, Jesus is saying in the, in the I Do Do Nothing section, you know, if you still uh, are attracted to the pleasures of the body and the pleasures of the world, you still find sin attractive, uh, is what he says in the Course. So, I mean, that's a pretty strong statement, as long as we're still invested in this world, then whether sin is real or not, if you believe there's still an attraction to guilt, if Jesus is saying in the Course, in your awareness, there's still something that needs to be uh, released or forgiven or undone. So even with that, you find connection. I'm just wondering like, where the balance is in that, like, find attractions in this world, because like, or, and to not have guilt. Yes. Because, like, I mean, I have kids, I got responsibilities with them, I, you know. I, I mean, I desire to be able to provide for them. And I don't know, I, I just don't, I feel like I don't have that all clear in myself. What, where do you draw a line with all that? Yeah. Wanting to give them worldly things, because we're here. Yeah, it's, it's very much... Everything with your children, with the people that are in your life, spouses, families, and so on and so forth, you're always teaching your mind, and you're teaching what you would learn. And yes, this definitely is a world of materialism, where it seems like there are a lot of things in the world that are important and attractive. And yet, I think that even like in relationships, where initially there can be attractions in terms of form and so forth, the more you go deeper into relationships, the more you get to that point of starting to say, what's really essential here? And things like integrity, honesty, respect, open communication. No matter how much in the beginning the attraction may have been involving the form, uh, it always moves to, to the things that are, reflect eternity, the things that will never go away. That those are the things that people finally say, those are the important things in life. And so, typically, even in working with children and everything, uh, as your mind begins to shift and you start to value the eternal, uh, the relationships that you seem to have also seem to shift as well. Maybe you had friendships that were based more on biology or on uh, common interests, um, liking the same things initially. And the more you get into the spiritual vibration, uh, you find that those things start to shift as well because you're not interested in doing the same thing that you did before. Uh, the things that used to catch your eye and catch your attention before are not, uh, are not there. So it works very much from the inside in, in a transformation of consciousness and, and it is really a question of, of what is it for and, and really looking at, gee, why do I do these things? You know, am I just going through the motion of the past? or doing what other people seem to do with their children? Or am I, is there something deeper here that I'm to, to go into? And that's what this gathering will be. It's like my kids are in sports. I don't know how much, what am I really, what are, what are they really learning with that? I mean, it's good exercise, but, you know, what am I really, te what, what are kids learning by learning, like, competitiveness and stuff like that? You know, um, yeah, good question. Know setting them up for something? Because then you always learn like one's better than another. You know, they just, you know. Well, any situation can be used in a helpful way. In other words, like even with like sports, you know, things like collaboration, uh, joining together and working can be used by the spirit as well. And then as you go deeper into your own spiritual journey, you, you would look at something like the idea of competition. For example, the Course teaches that uh, the Holy Spirit just uses the body as a means of communication, solely as a means of communication. That's not the way it's been for us in this world. We've used the body for many things. Um, I was just over in Spain, and uh, I was hosted by a family, and they had the, their uh, basketball national playoffs going on, and, 
and most of the men of the family were all riveted to the, uh, you know, to the TV set and saying to their wives and everything, well, we'll come into that gathering in a minute, but we've got this important game going on here. And in the gathering, we did start to get into the whole idea that, the, that that's one of the ego's uses of the body, is competition. Competition is an idea that, that, that God doesn't have any awareness of. And the ego, that's one of its uh, mainstays, you know, that's what keeps it going. So, whether we're talking about competition seemingly in sports or to the extreme, war, uh, in sports, like for example, I was using the example that in sports it seems like during competitions the body breaks down and they have to send in other players to replace the one. Uh, I said, well, it's not really what the body's doing that's breaking the body down. It's the guilt in the mind and using the body for the ego's purpose, which is competition, that then the body is a symbol of that guilt. It breaks down, it needs to be repaired, it needs to be reconstructed. <coughs> And if you carry that out to war, which is a, a competition, sports competition seems like a more milder version, but it's the same dynamics that go on in war. That's why countries need to send in more bodies when those bodies are injured or those bodies seem to be killed to promote a purpose of conflict or conquering, you know, send in the next replacements and we need more and we need more. So those are, you're asking really good questions and in the end, you'll start to see that it really comes back to your own mind. That as you start to develop more trust in the Holy Spirit, you'll realize that you can transcend this idea of competition, this idea of reciprocity. You know, you want win-win-win um, situations where everyone feels like they've gained and come away with something, and not this win-lose kind of uh, mentality, which in the end doesn't serve. Going back to the question she asked about uh, uh, doing things and acquiring stuff because you know we have jobs and bills and stuff like that. So there's a value to be engaged in, in life over here. Um, and in terms of drawing the line, can you talk about the role of non-attachment? Is that in, in Buddhism? You Yeah, non-attachment is, is essential. Non-attachment is very much synonymous with non-judgment. And you might say that every single day, every moment of every day, the real question comes down to a question of identity. So in other words, it's not so much what forms are involved. It's really coming down to, is it part of your identity? So in other words, you could, you've had times where you've gone to Brazil to do uh, healing uh, seminars and so on and so forth, and you could feel the energy and how everything was getting orchestrated and people were showing up and things were showing up and there was all this vibrancy and everything. It seemed to involve a lot of form stuff, uh, organization of gatherings, plane tickets, uh, this wasn't some mystic life of just sitting off in, uh, you know, in rural. Yeah, also money and stuff. Money, yes. A lot of things involved in that. And what this is really about is, is when you start to realize that as long as you're doing anything for a sense of pride, of building up a self-concept, uh, for the little me, uh, these skills will make me more marketable. Uh, these, this money will uh, bring better uh, lifestyle to me personally. Uh, it's as long as you're feeding the ego self, which is the self-concept identity. There's pride involved in that, and there's attachment involved in that. So that at the end of the day, when somebody says, you know, well, who was responsible for this, or who gets all the glory for this, this, and this, if you if you hold your hand up and say, it's me, <laughs> I'm the one, uh, I deserve the credit, then that's the pride of the ego speaking, and there's always attachment involved with that, and you may have a little bit of a, a pseudo-high, but you always get the lows that go along with that. In my case, for example, you know, when I just kind of gave it over and said, I'm going to do it all for the glory of God, I'm not going to identify with anything, I felt no need to author books, I felt no need to uh, make uh, something where there was followers or where we had a big community and so on and so forth. I felt, I felt no need for anything. I mean, 
in terms of like books and materials, I, I thought, well, look, with the, with the Bible, I looked at all the bu books that had been written already, and I looked at the Course, and I said, like you were saying, perfect. It's all so perfect already. There's nothing I need to add or contribute to that. So I just have gone around kind of just shining my light, sharing my happiness and joy, and then I occasionally answer emails and ended up putting books together. Uh, and I, oh my gosh, there's a book published. And it's like, oh my gosh. You know, it was kind of a surprise. Uh, somebody in Australia says, uh, can we take from some of those writings and, and can you do like a monthly column? We'll just do it all for you. We'll put it all in there and everything. And you'll just get the copies of it when it's done. How simple. They have a, a monthly column. You don't have to do anything. They just pull all your stuff <laughs> off the internet. And, you know, occasionally you get something in the mail and go, what did I say this time? Ooh, what's the topic this month? You know, you kind of, it's, but you see, it's like you're not invested. There's not a personal identity attachment to it. And that's really the key. It's not so much uh, simplicity or non-attachments in terms of uh, form, because we've had a lot of ascetics and monks that have tried to live these extremely simple lives just going off to the cave, and they just wear a little g-string, and you know, some of these ascetics eat a little piece of food, or a wafer here or there, or a sip of water. You know, uh, the simplicity we're aiming for is not a simplicity in form. It's a simplicity of being lined up with the Holy Spirit, and being tuned into the Source. Now that would be simple. Uh, that is simple. And what I find, that that's the key to non-attachment. When I'm in the flow of it, I get you know, they buy plane tickets, they take me. I was in, just within the span of the last six weeks, I've been to Paris twice, I've been to London twice, I've been to Munich four or five times, I've been to the Canary Islands, I've been to Madrid twice, I've been to Kansas, uh, I've been, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm staggered to kind of like to watch where this body gets used in all these ways, and there seems to be an enormous amount of logistics involved in that much travel, uh, luggage, and plane tickets, and gates, and departure times, and this and that. I'm having a ball. I, I'm just like uh, Mr. Magoo, uh, just uh, <laughs> flowing around, you know, wow, ooh, all this stuff is flowing by and everything. Because, because I really don't feel like I'm doing anything, and I really don't feel like, I feel like it's all orchestrated for me, and I just kind of show up and get to watch. And that's very different from this kind of sense of the personal I, trying to make a spiritual career or journey, which can seem to involve, oh, the doors close, and how do I get, how do I get noticed here, and how can I do more of what I want and still handle these bills? You know, it's, it's complicated to try to have a spiritual journey and let the ego come along on the backpack, or like piggyback along. It's like it seems to be a struggle or a strain when the ego is like, like a little leech, <laughs> like hanging on the back for dear life. So that's to me that everything comes down to identity. If, if you are really doing it all for the glory of God, uh, your reward is very uh, apparent in it's a stress-free life. And to the extent that pride is getting in there, then it doesn't matter so much what you're working with, uh, there's going to be an experience of complexity and stress.